and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today's episode is about population genetics and Hardy Weinberg problems. So we're going to get right into it. By the end of this video, you will be able to solve the typical Hardy Weinberg problem like this one. This is the one we're going to do. There's going to be a population of individuals. They're going to vary in a particular phenotype. And you're going to calculate the allelic frequencies and the genotype frequencies. So stay tuned. I am assuming some knowledge here. Um, if these principles are not familiar to you, you're going to want to check out my videos on Mendelian genetics and solving genetics problems. I will put the links in the down bar below. You will also need a calculator with a square root function to solve these problems. Now you might assume that the Hardy-Weinberg principle came about from two people named Hardy and Weinberg who worked together on this, and that's actually not true. I think it's important to put their work into perspective on a timeline here. We're going to start with Darwin. Now, Darwin had a lot of great ideas about natural selection and changing through time. But like all of his contemporaries, he believed that offspring were a blended version of their parents. Now, his work preceded Mendel, Mendel's famous publication, his experiments with his pea plants, in which he showed that what actually gets inherited are particles, that offspring are not a blended version of their parents. Now, you'd think this was a big deal, but in fact, in Mendel's time, it wasn't. His paper was not viewed as anything more than a paper on pea propagation. His paper was cited three times over the next 30 years. It was, however, rediscovered by two very important people, Hugo de Vry and Carl Korens, who were Dutch botanists, and they were two of the earliest geneticists. De Vry introduced the concept of the gene. He called them pan genes. And um, they rediscovered Mendel's work. So we're going to put Mendel back on this timeline right here in 1900, which is kind of cool considering he actually died in 1884. So now Mendelian genetics gets really hot. Everything is about these particles, there's no more blending, and we've got William Bateson and Reginald Punnett. Bateson was the first to use the term genetics. He and Punnett co-founded uh, Genetic Linkage, as well as the Journal of Genetics in 1910. Now, in 1908, during a lecture, Punnett was asked why recessive phenotypes persist over time. So, for example, if brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes, why is it that over time you don't end up with a whole population of brown brown-eyed individuals. Punnett was kind of stumped by this, and he didn't know the answer, but luckily he played cricket with somebody who did. G.H. Hardy was a mathematician. Actually, he was a pure mathematician, so he wasn't really interested in applied mathematics. But because Punnett was a good friend, he decided to help, and he wrote a paper. And in June of 1908, he very eloquently explained some of the mathematics behind the inheritance of alleles and genotypes in population, and it was met with great happiness, and it was called Hardy's Law. And it was all good until 1943, when it was discovered that somebody kind of beat Hardy to the punch, and a German physician by the name of Weinberg published a paper that was more eloquent, that was more clear, it was overall just better, in January of 1908. So Hardy's Law became no longer Hardy's Law. Now he's got to share it with Weinberg. So it became the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Turns out, though, that somebody beat both of them. The American geneticist William Castle wrote about these principles in 1903. So in truth, this should be called the Castle-Weinberg-Hardy principle. But that's a mouthful. So what is all this about? This is all about frequencies. And we are interested in the frequencies of a particular allele or a genotype in a population. There's tons of applications for this. Just one example would be determining the frequency of disease-causing alleles in a population. So for example, it's very important to know the frequency of the allele that causes cystic fibrosis. What the Hardy-Weinberg principle states is the following, that the frequency of alleles and genotypes in a population will remain constant over time in the absence of other evolutionary influences. So we're going to make some assumptions here. And there are a lot of assumptions, as you can see here. And some of them might strike you as being almost impossible. Um, you would be right. Uh, in the real world, many of these assumptions are not going to be true. So if you're asking yourself, well, then what's the point? 
Um, that, that's a good question. But in practice, it is the violation of Hardy-Weinberg assumptions that are sometimes the most important. So in other words, knowing how the real values deviate from the expected ones actually tells you a lot. Okay, so the nuts and bolts of how we're going to do this. Here we go. The frequency of the dominant allele, we're going to use the letter P to designate that. And the frequency of the recessive allele, we're going to use Q for that. So the first of my two helpful hints. The sum of all possible outcomes must equal 1. If you want lots of examples of this, you want to check out that Solving Genetics Problems video. And we're talking about the inheritance of a particular allele here, but this is also true for frequencies. So if you've got one dominant allele and one recessive allele, you're talking about the frequencies. If you add those frequencies together, they must equal one because you've got to have one or the other if there are only two alleles involved. Well, what's a genotype? A genotype is two alleles. So if you're interested in genotype frequency, then you've got allele number one, P plus Q equals one, and allele number two, P plus Q equals one. Now a genotype is allele number one and allele number two. That means multiply. So if both of those are equal to one, oh, does this look familiar? Yes, it does. You can use the FOIL rule, multiply those out, and you get p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals one. And this is going to be the key for Hardy-Weinberg equilibria. And the reason is p squared is going to give you the frequency of homozygous dominant genotype. 2pq is the frequency of the heterozygous genotype. q squared is the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. And that is it. If you happen to have a nasty question with three alleles involved, uh, don't worry. It's exactly the same. It's a little bit more involved, but it's the same principle. So that's the good news. Okay, we're going to stick with two alleles, though. And the best way to get a handle on all this is just to do a problem. So we're going to have a population of penguins, and we're going to look at one phenotype in particular, the color of their feet. So we're going to have a little, oh, aren't they cute, little population of penguins, and they're going to have two different foot colors. And we're going to use big Y for the yellow foot allele. So individuals that are homozygous dominant and heterozygous will express the yellow foot phenotype. And we're going to use a lowercase y for the blue foot Phenotype. So only individuals who are homozygous recessive will express blue feet. Typical Hardy-Weinberg question will ask you to calculate the frequencies of both of those alleles, as well as the frequencies of all three genotypes in the population. So the second helpful hint is that the key to the Hardy-Weinberg problems lies in the homozygous recessive individuals. And the reason is because those individuals, you can count. You can see them, right? You can't see the difference between the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous individuals, but you can see the homozygous recessive ones. So that's going to be the key. Here's our sample problem. We're going to have a population of 1,000 penguins. We're going to have 12 of them with blue feet. So that leaves you with 988 with yellow feet. Find the frequency of the blue and yellow allele, as well as the frequencies of all three genotypes. So the four steps to solving Hardy-Weinberg problems. I know they look scary, but we're going to take them one by one. Step number one, assign the alleles. The frequency of the dominant allele in this case, the yellow foot color, big Y, the frequency of that is going to be P. The frequency of the blue color allele, the recessive allele, that's Q. So we're going to fill out a little table. I like to make a little table. Looks like this. So big Y is going to be P, and little Y is going to be Q. That was easy. That's step one. Step two is to calculate Q by taking the square root of the number of homozygous recessive individuals. Pay attention to this. The number of penguins with blue feet is not Q. It's Q squared. Remember, because they need two copies of that recessive allele in order to express that phenotype. Students make mistakes here all the time. The number of homozygous recessive individuals is Q squared, not Q. So you can get Q very easily, but you got to take the square root of the number of homozygous recessive individuals. So what the problem tells you is that there are 12 of them. 12 out of 1,000, that's 0 0.012. That's Q squared. To get Q, you got to take the square root of that number. 
0.1095, we're going to round that to 0.11. That's Q. So we're going to fill that in right here. Now, the good news is, once you have Q, you can easily get P, because P plus Q must equal 1. So back on this table, by the way, you notice I'm rounding everything to two significant figures. So to get P, I just subtract 0.11 from the number 1. So I get the allele frequency of the dominant allele to be 0.89. Once I have P and Q, I can calculate all the other genotype frequencies. So I'm going to get the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals. That's going to be P squared. That's 0.89 squared. I'm going to get for the heterozygous individuals, 2PQ. So in this case, that's 2 times 0.89 times 0.11. And that's 0 0.20. And now I have filled out the table completely. And that's it. That's really all you need. So you can fill out this entire table by knowing only the number of homozygous recessive individuals. This is really the key. And if you keep this in mind, it shouldn't be too bad. Just one more little uh, visual here. Some students of mine find this very helpful if, if they forget the equation or they forget what it means. If you cross two heterozygous individuals, so in other words, cross a P and a Q against a P and a Q, then uh, you'll get this. And uh, it, that should help you to make some sense of it. Okay. If you want to try another one, of course you do. Here's some mice that come in two different coat colors. Same thing, all I tell you is the number of mice that express the homozygous recessive phenotype. So here's a little table for you to fill out and give it a go. I'm going to put the answer in the description bar and also a link to the step-by-step -step solutions. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons, like, share, and subscribe. Join me on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.